Hey there, it's Mike Rowe, and this is The Way I Heard It, the only podcast for the curious mind with a short attention span. This is episode number 149, and I call it Broadswords in a Pit. <laughs> Hold on, let me, uh, <clears throat> let me say it properly. Broadswords in a Pit. <laughs> I'm kind of proud of that one. May have outdone myself with my favorite title thus far. Broadswords in a Pit is fun to say, and uh, more importantly, it's an accurate description of what happens in the tale you're about to hear. I'll uh, talk a bit more about the title and the subject of this story in a new segment right after the podcast called The Way I Talked About the Way I Heard It. I tried this last week. Your feedback was almost unanimous in its uh, enthusiasm for more. Most of you, it seems, enjoy the prospect of deconstructing the process that leads to these stories and learning a bit more about the fascinating subjects contained therein. I say most of you and nearly all of you because one of you is, uh, is not a fan of this idea, and that person happens to be the producer of this podcast, <laughs> my old friend Chuck Klausmeyer, who is listening to this right now as he's loading it into the machine and shaking his head in, in frustration. Uh, Chuck is a dear old childhood friend who's been with me, stuck with me over the years, proved himself useful in many of the projects that I get involved in. He now works with my foundation. He produces this podcast, and he, for whatever reason, is deeply, uh, pathologically opposed to change. Uh, all manner of change. Don't know how this happened to him, <laughs> but he's worried to death that by... Uh, rambling and free associating for a few minutes at the end of each of these stories, I'm going to lengthen the overall podcast itself, thereby uh, robbing me of the ability to claim that this is the only podcast for the curious mind with a short attention span. And, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's worried, perhaps justifiably so, perhaps not. We'll delve in to uh, more of what makes Chuck tick. <laughs> after the story you're about to hear, which, as you may recall, is called, say it with me, Broadswords in a Pit. And it's brought to you by my friends at Lightstream. Thank you, Lightstream, for sponsoring this podcast and for creating a product that actually does what you say it will do. I have heard uh, over the last few months from many listeners who have tried Lightstream, <laughs> Lightstream, Hey, I scream for Lightstream, and you will too if you want to consolidate your credit card debt. That's what Lightstream does. It gives people with decent credit an opportunity to pay a lot less in interest. And as Chuck will tell you, and anyone who knows me, I have a pathological fear of debt. So I will tell you right out of the gate, never borrow money needlessly. But for crying out loud, if you have a credit card balance... Don't pay more than you need in interest. Millions of Americans are making this mistake right now. And I, it, I think it's scandalous. The average national interest rate on credit cards is over 20% APR. It's criminal. You can, in moments, find out if you qualify for a credit card consolidation loan from Lightstream. They give loans from between $5,000 and $100,000. But here's the important thing. No fees. Zero. You can even get your money as soon as the day you apply. And we're talking about rates as low as 5.95% APR with auto pay. What that means if you're maintaining a balance is that you could be saving hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars a year in interest payments. Find out if that could be you. In fact, go to lightstream.com slash row and you'll get a special interest rate discount that allows you to save even more. But you got to go to L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash row. Subject to credit approval. Rate includes 0.50% auto pay discount. Terms and conditions apply. And offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com slash row for more information. Now that was the disclaimer, obviously. I had to read that. But I don't have to tell you this. I scream. You scream. We all scream <laughs> for Lightstream. What do you think? Should that be their new slogan? I'm thinking maybe. Drop me a line on my Facebook page. Tell me what you think. Seriously, let me know if you use Lightstream and if you're a satisfied customer. It's important for me to know that kind of thing. This is The Way I Heard It. More specifically, broadswords in a pit.
James sat at his kitchen table, reading the newspaper and trembling with rage. As the duly appointed state auditor of Illinois, he was accustomed to being criticized by disgruntled Republicans. But this was something else altogether. This was a letter to the editor, written by a sharp-tongued woman who identified herself only as Rebecca. Not only did this Rebecca accuse him of bankrupting her state with his, quote, disastrous democratic policies, she did so in a way that mocked his vanity. In the most offensive passage, she imagined him addressing a group of distraught women unable to pay their bills because of his recent decision to eliminate paper money in favor of gold and silver. Dear girls, the passage began, I can see you are in distress, but please understand, I cannot marry you all. Too well I know how much you suffer, but do, do remember, it is not my fault that I am so handsome and so very interesting. The gall, the temerity, what did this Rebecca know about the complexities of modern banking, and what sort of editor would allow such baseless aspersions to be cast from a critic with no last name? Livid and humiliated, James paid a visit to the editor of the Sangamo Journal, who tried to explain the nature of satire to the apoplectic Democrat to no avail. He insisted on knowing the identity of Rebecca, so the editor told him, Rebecca he said, was actually a man, a concerned citizen whose real name the state auditor recognized immediately. James wasted no time demanding an apology, which he sent via courier. It read, Sir, I have become the object of slander, vituperation, and personal abuse. Only a full retraction may prevent consequences which no one will regret more than myself. The man, called Rebecca, delighted to learn that his words had struck a chord, responded thusly, I might consider a public retraction if you could but reframe your request in a more gentlemanly fashion. Once again, James trembled with rage. A more gentlemanly fashion? Was he serious? This cowardly gutter snipe impugns his good name in a most unforgivable fashion, and now, given the opportunity to apologize, he chooses instead to lecture the state auditor on manners? This was outrageous. So James did the only thing an honorable man in his position could do. He challenged Rebecca to a duel. Pistols at dawn, he demanded. My honor requires it. In those days, dueling was illegal in Illinois, but over on Bloody Island, just a quick boat ride across the Mississippi, the great state of Missouri had no law forbidding grown men from shooting each other over a question of honor. Unfortunately, in his rush for satisfaction, James had overlooked an important bit of dueling protocol. The challenger does not determine the weapons or the venue. That falls to the one being challenged. Thus, his invitation was accepted, but not his terms. Never mind the pistols, said the man called Rebecca. Let us settle the matter like men. Let us proceed at dawn with broadswords in a pit. Broadswords in a pit? Good Lord, thought James, who was this guy? What sort of savage fights with broadswords when pistols were readily available? But the man called Rebecca had further conditions. He demanded they place a plank on the ground between them, a divider at the bottom of the pit, which neither combatant could step across. Crossing the plank, he insisted, would be considered a mortal foul, punishable by an immediate bullet to the head. In that moment, James began to see the magnitude of his miscalculation. He was an excellent shot, but had little experience with a sword. Worse, he was only 5'8". His rival was much taller, with arms that dangled nearly to his knees and hands the size of ham hocks. 
In those mitts, a broadsword would be a fearsome weapon indeed, and with an extra foot of reach, James realized he'd never get close enough to land a blow. But there was no backing out now. His honor would not permit it. And so, on the morning of September 22nd, 1842, a large crowd sailed over to Bloody Island to watch two honorable men hack each other to pieces with broadswords. Inside the pit, on his side of the plank, James felt sick to his stomach. The giant across from him seemed utterly relaxed as he swung the massive cavalry sword over his head, grinning as the blade swooshed through the air. It was a chilling sound, and it made James wonder about the crunch it would make when it collided with flesh and bone. Then, as if to answer that very question, his rival walked to the far side of the enclosure, where a thick branch from an oak tree drooped into the pit. Still grinning, he swung his sword with one hand, severing the branch in a single blow and earning a collective gasp from those assembled. This would be over quickly. James felt his sphincter tighten as his adversary walked up to the plank that divided them, waiting to engage. His options were now simple. Refuse to step forward and live the rest of his life in shame, or square off against a man who was certain to kill him. Ultimately, James chose death before dishonor, and slowly approached his towering rival, who surprised him with an unanticipated offer. "'Are you quite certain, sir, that you wouldn't prefer to discuss the root causes of our dispute before we come to blows?' James quickly accepted, as the crowd above them breathed a sigh of relief. Though many in attendance would have liked to see the state auditor run out of office, no one wanted to see him hacked to death in a pit, including the concerned citizen whose words had both instigated and diffused the entire situation. As for his choice of venue and weaponry, he later explained, quote, I couldn't very well refuse his demand for satisfaction, but I didn't want the damned fella to kill me, which he would have surely done had I agreed to pistols. On the other hand, I didn't want to kill him either, but felt sure I could disarm him with a blade if it actually came to blows. The life spared that day belonged to James Shields, the only man elected senator to three different states, a vain but honorable man who went on to distinguish himself in battle as an officer in the Union Army. As for his adversary, the modern-day gladiator who could have killed him but didn't, he went on to become James Shields' boss, the same boss who promoted him to the rank of Major General 20 years after their aborted duel, proving, once again, it's better to bury the hatchet than swing the sword. Such was the deeply held belief of a concerned citizen who always preferred a diplomatic solution, but was willing, when necessary, to settle things with broadswords in a pit which is pretty much what happened when the Army of Northern Virginia refused to back down, choosing instead to face off against the Army of the Potomac. Happily, America survived that terrible duel, and though we emerged from the pit, bloodied, and forever changed, we were still united, thanks to a country lawyer who called himself Rebecca, long before the rest of the country called him president, a president named Lincoln. Anyway, that's the way I heard it. And that is why Abraham Lincoln is still my favorite president. This is the way I talked about the way I heard it. First of all, before we get started, with deference to my producer Chuck, who, as I mentioned at the outset, is horrified that I'm going to Uh, lengthen our podcast unnecessarily and inordinately. Let me say that the podcast itself is over. It ended with do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do. This. This is something you're under no obligation to listen to. In fact, you're under no obligation to listen to any of it, obviously. But uh, to be perfectly clear, this is just going to be a few minutes of me explaining why the story you just heard came. 